Clearly, we're not yet at the point of all-out conflict, but it is worth dwelling on the numbers. Russia has a military force comprising, well, around about 845,000 troops, and that compares to Ukraine's 130,000. And in terms of spending, well, it's a similar story. Last year, Russia's defence budget was $68.2 billion, and that's considerably more than the $2.4 billion uh, spent by Ukraine. Although Ukraine's military might is not inconsiderable, it has far less strength in the crisis. Crimea region. Now that's thanks to an agreement brokered in 2010. Russia can therefore station up to 161 aircraft at bases there and 388 warships and other vessels in Ukraine's waters. Now, before the crisis broke out, Russia already had 13,000 troops deployed in Ukraine. Neil, thank you. Well, uh, with us now is our foreign affairs editor, Sam Kiley. We saw there the numbers. Um, no comparison, really, 130,000 to uh, 845,000. Is the reality now that Crimea is effectively under Russian control? Yeah, there's no, I don't think there's any prospect of a war unless the Kiev government, the central government, uh, decide to reimpose central com command and control over the Crimea. Now, frankly, as Neil's just demonstrated, they don't have the firepower to do that, nor do they have any kind of an incentive. They're going to try uh, to uh, forge much closer links and work diplomatically through the United States, through the European uh, Union, uh, and indeed uh, they're getting a great deal of support, but it's all verbal support at the moment. Last night, um, President Obama rang uh, Putin. They had a 90-minute conversation between the two presidents in which Mr. Obama laid out his concerns and, uh, and uh, Senator Kerry has said that there is a threat to peace and stability in the region. There's a lot of noise coming out of the West, but they don't have any real levers of power. They're not going to get involved militarily. The best thing that they can do is, is try and get the Kiev government up, standing up economically as quickly as possible uh, so that they can at least consolidate the control over the areas that really are uh, still under the centralized control. There's not just the Crimea there. You've got uh, Putin has now uh, been a, uh, given the right from the Russian parliament to intervene anywhere he chooses in the Ukraine. And in particular that eastern area, uh, which is uh, his west, which is the sort of ethnically Russian dominated uh, zones. And those will be the areas that could become more and more fractious as, as time wears on. That is where the danger lies and that is where... Uh, the boogie, boogie word balkanization could occur. My own view is that I think that probably now that they've got the, the Crimea under Russian control, uh, the Kremlin will settle down and let things work, work their way through on a, on a diplomatic level. Uh, and in your view, is Kiev going to be happy to have Crimea annexed off, as it were? Well, no. I mean, it's, there, is, there are a, a number of international agreements. There's a, a memorandum of understanding that's signed by the international community, notably Russia and uh, Europe, other European nations, guaranteeing the territorial integrity of the Ukraine, and that includes Crimea. So what that means, ultimately, is that there is a legal responsibility both on Russia and on uh, the Kiev government's allies in maintaining that territorial integrity. But so long as it doesn't actually secede, the Russians can continue to argue that they're there uh, effectively as peacekeeping forces and so on. It's not an easy argument to make, but it's not an argument that anybody's going to confront physically. They're going to try and confront it diplomatically. But the worst threat that's come up so far uh, is a sort of petulant uh, line coming out of the West that, that may snub the G8 summit in yes, uh, June in, in, in Sochi. Summer. Yeah, uh, and Russia does have to convince that they're not breaking any international law. Stand for the moment. Thank you very much.